Good morning, and thank you all for being here today to hear me tell you how to turn the water supply pink for one million people. My name is Gia Destuni, and I am a professor and head of the Department of Physical Geography at Stockholm University. And the pink story is one example of a wicked water problem. In my talk today, I will share with you some key insights about this and other uh, wicked problems, what characterizes them, and the types of research and education needed for solving them. The pink water story happened in 2000 three in Miami-Dade County of South Florida, USA. And what people saw at the event was the red dye streaming through faucets and shower heads, underwear and other clothes turning pink in the washing machines, uh, red water along the edges of the Miami River. And uh, eventually they were happy to hear that the dye was harmless. Um, so they needn't boil their water as uh, they were uh, ensured by uh, county officials. So uh, this event uh, itself uh, was rather funny but also dramatic and illustrative enough so that it helps highlight a serious coupled uh, societal and environmental problem with no clear or simple solution. So let me explain a bit more what it is, this is about. Miami-Dade County uh, has a large field of wells from where groundwater is pumped to provide drinking and household water for a million people. This is circled in red in the figure. And around these wells, there is rock mining going on with a number of existing permitted and proposed um, mine lakes, uh, which would then if permitted as asked for, would uh, totally surround the well field. So the condition for uh, uh, giving permission for this uh, requires uh, evidence of no risk of pathogens in the mine lakes to reach the groundwater wells, which provide this drinking and household water and the types of path pathogens that could uh, and be transported with the groundwater and, and uh, come into the water supply. Uh, you can see examples of them here, Giardia, Cryptosporidium. Uh, and in fact, since 2003, there have been uh, increasing numbers uh, of uh, Cryptosporidium outbreaks uh, in different water supplies, including here in Sweden. So, as a basis for uh, deciding on this permission, uh, county officials had calculated long transport times to the wells from the surrounding mine lakes. And you see here uh, the yellow numbers uh, to the left that uh, the transport times were calculated to be at least uh, 30 days from the nearest mine lakes and, and much longer uh, than that for uh, mine lakes further apart. And this would then be in compliance with the applicable regulations. Uh, and that regulation required uh, these long travel times um, in order not to have to add costly treatment facilities for uh, providing the uh, clean water supply. So these uh, transport times would ensure that natural groundwater filtration and retention of the pathogens would occur so that they couldn't reach the wells. To demonstrate these conditions, um, the county called for the US geological survey scientists to come and test the calculated transport times. And the USGS scientists did come and they did carry out a test by injecting a harmless dye, red dye called rhodamine, and as a control also the harmless deuterium as another tracer. They inject that in an injection well and would then wait for these tracers to uh, arrive at an appropriately placed detection pumping well. 
So they did this test one afternoon, went back to their hotel and expected the first tracer detection to, to occur at earliest after many days or weeks. However, something else happened. And you can see what in the peaks of these tracer breakthrough curves detected only some hours after injection. So the, uh, after these hours, it was in the middle of the night and uh, the USGS uh, scientists were woken up by their phones, phones exploding and all hell breaking loose. Uh, because by then water was red, not just in the detection well as it should, but around the whole county, in people's homes, in water uh, supply plant, uh, the river, in factories and various products that were also colored red. Uh, so I will now let you know a bit more about this whole story from TV news that were broadcast at that time. Well, is the drinking water for a million people in South Florida at future risk of dangerous contamination? Tonight, Jeff Burnside is live with an EcoWatch investigation and surprising video of what happened to our water during the red dye test, Jeff. Jackie, you've never probably thought twice about it. You go to the kitchen, you turn on the tap, and you get a glass of water. But did you know that South Florida's tap water comes from just one source? And now there's concern that an unusual test shows that deadly contaminants could get into our water. It looked like the scene out of a movie. The drinking water for a million people turned red. But the harmless dye was a test to see whether a potentially deadly contaminant could get into the South Florida water supply. Nearby tap water turned pink. Shock, complete shock. Environmentalists like Barbara Lang feel the test backs their theory. The warning to the general population of Milwaukee that contaminants could get into the water supply. I don't plan on drinking anything. As they did in Milwaukee in 1993, killing 100 people and making 400,000 people sick. I've been sick the past two days. I've got a baby at home and two kids that are sick. People are dropping all over the place. We have a pristine water source of water here. And most cities in the country, in the United States, want to protect that pristine source. And Miami-Dade County is mining it. She means the rock mining industry in West Miami-Dade, one of the largest in the country. They dig up limestone for cement, asphalt, pipes. It dumps into the local economy $550 million a year. And now it's been given the permits to double or even triple in size. It's a much larger economic engine than, than people realize. But there's concern these big pits could, in coming years, taint the water supply. Under heavy security sit 15 of these massive wellheads pumping drinking water for the northern half of Miami-Dade County. Trouble is, the wellheads will be surrounded by 22,000 acres of rock mining pits. Existing pits in blue, future pits in brown and green, kept at least 2,500 feet from the nearest wellhead. Critics are worried that those pits remove some of the Earth's natural ability to filter out harmful or deadly pathogens called cryptosporidium and giardia, allowing them to get into the wellheads nearby. That's why they injected the red dye to see how fast it would move through the rocks and into the wellheads. Unfortunately, we found out some information about the strata in the well field that we had not known before, and, and a large amount of this material came in all at one time. Officials thought the red dye would take days to show up. Instead, it took hours. Well, that was not expected. It caught top county environmental protection officials off guard. I think it was it, it was uh, somewhat of a surprise, and it was expected to take a lot longer. The official analysis of the red dye tests are still months away, but environmental groups were so alarmed, they hired an independent expert to analyze government data. They conclude the new rock mines will, quote, pose a significant and undisclosed threat to the area's drinking water. They want action now. I don't think you wait when it's a public when there's a risk to the public health. The rock mining industry says their top priority is to keep the underground water supply safe. Rock mining is very compatible with the with the well field and water supply. And that's that's why the wells came out here. The rock miners were here first. 
officially, the county says there's no need to worry. I think we need to, to make sure that the public understand that there is no safety problem at this time. But this internal memo expresses some concern. Miami-Dade County Manager George Burgess says the red dye tests will, quote, most probably, end quote, mean new mines need to dig farther away from the wellheads. But if new mines are pushed farther away to protect nearby drinking water wells, taxpayers may have to pay millions to the mining companies for lost profits because they've already been given permits to start digging. If they wanted to take the land, they'd have to pay for it. Now, those contaminants have never been detected in the local water supply. But that also means the treatment plants are not set up to filter it out, and to do so would cost tens of millions of dollars, with no guarantee that the rock mining companies would pay for that either. Environmentalists are suing to try to stop the whole thing. We have much more information on our EcoWatch webpage at NBC6.net. Live in North Miami, Jeff Burnside, NBC6. Well, the USGS test had so dramatic effects because the scientists happened to use two large amounts of dye in combination with the uh, uh, transport times being misjudged. But uh, since the dye was harmless, uh, the test result uh, is a very good example for demonstrating and highlighting the complexity and calculation uh, difficulties of the involved uh, groundwater transport problem. But such calculation difficulties uh, alone do not make a wicked problem. The Miami-Dade water problem is wicked because it combines several more complexities that together characterize wicked problems. So wicked problems involve uh, complexity in both social and ecological components and the coupling of these. In the Miami-Dade case, the water problem involved both complex groundwater behavior and complex implications for people water supply, their health and uh, or costs uh, for uh, clean water, for having clean water as well as uh, complexities involving the mining industry and county economics and jobs for people. So as such, a wicked problem has no single answers or simple solutions. The solution opportunities and attempts to solve the problem affect various things and aspects that people actually depend on. Uh, they have to deal with outcomes that are only to some degree foreseeable, and they require agreements and changes in approaches and behaviors among different actors. Going forward in time for the wicked water problem in Miami-Dade, we can see from these, this news item from 2015 that the problem remained unsolved more than a decade after the red dye test. At that time, a bill was being pushed to let the water users and taxpayers pay the costs for additional water treatment facilities, while the rock mining industry was let off the hook of having to pay millions in fees for increasing, uh, for having increase the risk of water pollution. Uh, at any rate, uh, we can learn from this and many other such wicked water problem examples that research and education for solving these types of problems involve various disciplines and societal sectors and actors. So, I move on now to exemplify uh, such ongoing research in an EU project called COSTO, standing for a collaborative land-sea integration platform. This research, research uh, wrestles with wicked problems in the coastal land parts uh, where lots of people tend to live and the associated uh, near coastal uh, and inland waters and coastal waters and their ecosystems where pressures and impacts combine from land, from sea and from climate changes. 
The coastal research platform includes six coastal case studies across Europe. And each of these involve many actors and stakeholders from different sectors. And therefore we refer to them as multi-actor labs. Uh, our research team at Stockholm University leads the Baltic Sea Lab that you see here emphasized in red in, in uh, the figure. Here you also see the logos of uh, many partners around Europe that collaborate with this, this, this coastal project. So the different coastal case studies have different main problems and focus on finding uh, collaborative uh, solutions to them. The Baltic case uh, uh, study uh, focuses on the main problem of mitigating inland, coastal, marine water pollution and eutrophication for uh, uh, an environmentally, socially and economically sustainable development in both the coastal areas and the surrounding rural areas under a changing uh, climate. To find the possible solutions to this complex problem, we then need to consider various intersector and interdisciplinary interactions that affect the eutrophication problem and the, the conditions for the different sectors that impact on the problem. And thereby we have to involve and account for multiple actor and stakeholder perspectives interests and interactions among them. To understand uh, these perspectives and interests in our research, we then have in the coastal project, in each and all of the different case studies, held workshops with different actors and stakeholders where we have, uh, they have, and we also as researchers have together co-created so-called causal loop diagrams. This is what such diagrams uh, look like uh, from different sector perspectives. And you see in each panel the different uh, sector themes uh, where, um, from the workshops uh, where these diagrams were co-created. You cannot see the details, but you can see the overall complexity uh, of the diagrams that kind of illustrate what a wicked water problem <laughs> can look like. So zooming in to one of these diagrams, we can then start to see some more details of the land-sea system interactions that the workshop participants perceive and perceive that the point as important in affecting the Baltic case water eutrophication and pollution problem and the possible solutions to it. So I have highlighted uh, some water aspects uh, here that uh, um, are included. And I have also highlighted an aspect that has come up in, in nearly all of the uh, workshops. And that is that participants found that there is lack of complexity handling capacity in society and in various organizations and authorities involved. And uh, they, entered this type of capacity in these causal uh, diagram to emphasize the need for it. Um, so as a first step of, in our research, we had to take these uh, different stakeholder perspectives and expressed in, the, in these complex diagrams and combine them into a unified, simplified, map that we call the fuzzy cognitive map and that you see here. Um, even though this is greatly simplified, uh, it still has 31 variables of very different types with 160 connections and 567 feedback loops between them. 
we can use uh, this type of mapping uh, by assigning interaction directions, that's the arrow directions that you can see here, and impact uh, directions, that's the plus and minus signs uh, that you can also maybe see uh, besides the arrows. And we can then use uh, this um, uh, system interactions to try to assess some key system behavior aspects and where system equilibria are. But beyond such a semi-quantitative system assessment, this map is still far too complex and wicked for us to be able to fully quantify it. Yes, yet we do need full quantification to identify and compare possible solution pathways. So a next uh, research step for us was to further simplify and break out some sub-problem systems that we can actually fully quantify by so-called systems uh, dynamics modeling. And this type of uh, systems uh, model is, is uh, uh, shown here. Uh, what we do in this modeling is that we trace water flows and the nutrients that the water uh, carries through different sectors and land uses like agriculture, forest, urban areas, utilities for water and wastewater, and natural water systems like uh, surface waters and subsurface water and the flow processes through them. And uh, through this tracing, we can then calculate implications of various scenarios. So for instance, climate change, urbanization, agriculture, and tourism developments, and what these imply for the water availability and quality in the different sectors and uh, between in inland waters and coastal waters. And uh, for example, the risk of seawater intrusion into fresh groundwater and nutrient exchanges in and among the different sectors and ultimately leading to loads, nutrient loads to the sea that determine the eutrophication problem there. So in order for us to be able to quantify this and for the systems modeling to be relevant and realistic, we also need to support the quantifications uh, and validate them by independent traditional disciplinary science and data. And this is what this figure illustrates. And I will now exemplify this type of support uh, by model simulations we have carried out uh, for one coastal uh, area in the Baltic case. And this is the Himefjarden Bay example. You can see where it is located in Sweden and uh, in the uh, whole Baltic Sea catchment area in the map to the left. And then you zoom in to the coastal uh, waters themselves in the map to the right. And uh, what we simulate here is water quality responses to various combinations of uh, potential future nutrient management scenarios, along with potential future climate scenarios. And the management scenarios include and compare measures that can be done locally in the uh, local catchment of the bay, locally in the coastal waters and overall in the total Baltic Sea catchment with associated open sea effects that then feed in from the sea to the coastal zone. So here I exemplify some results, uh, the types of results that come, can come out from these simulations. And what these simulations do is link environmental policy requirements of good water status in, in all uh, uh, water systems and the uh, two possible management solutions for coastal eutrophication mitigation uh, under different climate conditions. So what you see here in the diagram I-axis uh, y-axis is uh, the relative coastal part 
relative area where good status is achieved for the example of chlorophyll A, which is related to the eutrophication and algae blooms in the coastal zone. And the value of one here means good status everywhere, whereas the value of zero be, means no good status anywhere in the coastal zone. The different bar colors represent different uh, climate scenarios where we have tested dry cold, dry warm, wet warm types of scenarios. And the different sets of bars that are numbered represent different nutrient management scenarios in either not doing anything beyond what we do now, that's the base case, or doing something locally in the land uh, catchment of the coast, or doing something in the coast itself, <clears throat> or only large scale uh, measures in other areas feeding in through the sea to this coastal region, or uh, combining land and sea measures. And uh, I will not go into the details of this result, just shortly uh, summarize that the simulation results overall imply that if we want eutrophication solutions, mitigation solutions to work well under different climates, then the management measures uh, are need to be taken over the whole Baltic land catchment with associated open sea effects. It's not enough with just local measures uh, in the individual coastal zone. And I uh, end uh, this, um, uh, also end my near the end, of my, uh, the end of my presentation by summarizing here the combined overall approach that I just went through uh, from the coastal project for wicked water problems, where participatory multi-stakeholder co-creation of causal loop diagrams is used to represent the various stakeholder uh, perspectives of main land sea interactions uh, affecting the problem that needs to be solved. Uh, the researchers then carrying uh, and combining these different causal loop uh, diagrams into unified, simplified cognitive mapping, where we can to some degree uh, assess uh, effect of interaction directions and impact uh, signs. And then further simplification of this to systems dynamic modeling, uh, where we have taken out key quantifiable interaction uh, components. And then we go back to the stakeholders and uh, discuss and validate how we have done this uh, simplification and what are the implications of that for different scenarios. We discuss that with them. And meanwhile, we also use our traditional disciplinary science represented here by numerical model simulations to support the realism and, and uh, validate uh, the systems dynamics modeling. And finally, I end my presentation with this general conclusion that solutions to wicked water problems for a sustainable future do require inter and transdisciplinary research and education. And I thank you for listening to me and uh, leave you now to discuss further in, in the coming sessions uh, during this day, how to actually manage to achieve such inter and transdisciplinarity in higher education and in particular within the CIVIS uh, network. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of this uh, conference.